Hey you all, Carpetbagger here, coming to you live from the north. More specifically, we are in Buffalo, New York, and even more specifically than that, we are in front of the Buffalo Science Museum. Now, this is maybe what I consider to be the lost episode of the Carpetbagger, because back in December, I visited this museum, I filmed my experience, and then uh, when I went to edit the footage, I had accidentally deleted everything. I, I went through a whole process of trying to get my footage back. I tried to, you know, use an online program to help restore um, the deleted pictures, tried to get them back off the SD card, tried to get them off my computer hard drive, but alas, they were completely gone. I don't know if anyone's been through this experience trying to get back deleted files. You find these, you find these, these websites that say they can do it, and then it, it's just, it's, it's a hassle. It doesn't work. There's probably some way to get it back, but nothing that was within uh, my capability to get, to get this, uh, get these files back. So I have returned. Months later, I've returned, because I really enjoyed my experience here at the Buffalo Science Museum. Some really cool things and quirky things that maybe you wouldn't find at all uh, all museums. And I love, I love checking out local museums, local natural history museums, local, his, local natural history museums, local regular history museums. Uh, in fact, if you guys know other museums you'd like to see me check out, they can be your local museum, or you know, they can be museums in, in other cities that are are definitely worth stopping in please leave a comment in the comment section definitely looking for more museums to visit I love nothing more than just spending an afternoon at a wonderful uh, museum but uh, yeah so we're back it's take two and hopefully I can show you uh, the wonders that lie with within the Buffalo Science Museum so please follow me Now as we enter the museum, we're greeted by these uh, Victorian type displays here, these glass cases that just have a ton of different specimens in it. This animal here is called a markhor, and then down here we have a Venus flytrap. Oh, he's actually, this is a, like an enlarged Venus flytrap, you can actually see it has a giant fly trapped inside. And here in front we have the tusk of a mastodon. And like I said, this is kind of like the Victorian style of museum where you just kind of put a bunch of interesting things into a display case together. And over here we've got this mandrill, which is a type of uh, type of baboon. This giant bug here is a western conifer seed bug. You have the uh, the, the preserved bugs right there, and then the giant diagram right there. Now look at the variety in this case. We've got a painting of George W. Clinton. Not, not sure who he is, but that's his name. The big old peacock, and then a black bear, and a row of, uh, of dead seagulls. This is the box of a missionary here. I guess the different uh, supplies a missionary would travel with. See the, you know, there's the rosary beads there, a the little cross, and in the back, there's an exploded human skeleton. Now by exploded, they don't mean that it was in some sort of bombing or horrible accident, but the exploding a, a skeleton is actually like taking every part of the skeleton apart and displaying it separately. This is an Egyptian Egyptian vulture with an ostrich egg. See, he's actually got a rock in his mouth. Looks like he's getting ready to smash that ostrich egg with the rock. Is that is that what Egyptian vultures do? It's that Easter Island head here. It is a smaller version, but it does say this is actually from Easter Island. Some jars of fun down here and uh, a taxidermied chimpanzee in this case. Look at that big old, big old fruit bat behind him. 
Here we have the museum's mascot, Stuffy the Buffalo. You can see here, uh, very appropriate because we are in the city of Buffalo. Although fun fact, um, Buffalo never actually lived in, uh, in the area. So the city of Buffalo never had any actual wild buffalo, but they did have Stuffy, who's been here at the museum since 1895, although it does say down here, he did uh, leave the museum for several years. He went to live at uh, the Central Terminal in Buffalo with a sign that said, visit the Buffalo Science Museum. So he was an ambassador to try to get people to come to the museum. And one interesting thing I'm, I'm seeing here, it says, in order to keep Stuffy safe from visitors to enjoy for many years, various chemicals have been used to preserve his fur, which is, you know, standard with, with taxidermy, especially older taxidermy. It's been treated with a lot, of, a lot of various chemicals, some not so safe. It says, although he is safe to talk to and look at, he is not safe to touch. I don't know, have you ever met a, a piece of taxidermy that was not safe to talk to? That, that would be scary. Is that, <laughs> if there was taxidermy that you could somehow endanger yourself by speaking to it, that would be terrifying. That sounds like a horror movie. But Stuffy here, he loves hearing, uh, he loves hearing visitors tell him stories. Also in the lobby, we have this big old moose here. Look at that big guy. Over here we have a mute swan. I think part of the reason he's being so quiet is the fact that he's uh, taxidermied. Of course we have some dinosaur skeletons here as well. This is the Albertosaurus. So we travel up the stairs. There's a few more of these glass boxes full of wonders. See that big, that big monkey there. It's a black and white Colobus monkey. Also have a walrus's skull. Those tusks. And this is a little sloth skeleton, a little sleepy sloth skeleton. And look at this, uh, this wall of butterflies and insects back there. This is a quiet area over here where you can sit and relax while visiting the museum, but be careful, don't be too quiet. You've got a giant thresher shark hanging up above. And another big shark in this, uh, in this case here. And uh, a baby camel. That looks like a nice little, nice little camel. He probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't ever bite somebody, but uh, this snail here, look at that. It's like a uh, diagram of the inside of a snail. I never knew there was so much inside of a snail there. It actually changed quite a bit since December. Over here uh, in December they had an exhibit on bees, an exhibit on snow. See that they've both been replaced by a uh, virtual reality attraction. Of course, uh, virtual reality notoriously difficult to show uh, in a vlog. And here we have a giant mastodon here in the center of the hallway. And this, was, this one has a name too. This is Seymour. Seymour the Mastodon. And a T-Rex skull there behind this, uh, behind this velvety rope. And here we have another uh, taxidermy specimen with a name. This is Grand Pop, the Galapagos uh, land tortoise. And uh, he lived at the New York Zoological Park. So yeah, a lot of times when you do see animals in, uh, in museums, they often are from zoos. When they pass away at zoos, they are repurposed as permanent uh, taxidermy displays at uh, museums. We're about to enter the biodiversity section here. Let's see, they have quite a collection of animals in this display. Got a uh, jaguar right there. And uh, that behind it's called the spectacled bear. Spectacled bear. Got a collection of moths there pinned to uh, that giant leaf. These are all different species 
from the rainforests in South America. Got the uh, big iguana right there. There's another spectacled bear. And I said they're saying that the spectacled bear is the only bear in South America. I didn't realize they only had one type of bear. There's a Cody. It's a, uh, I, I remember seeing these when I was in Mexico and they were, I know they're, they're kind of like giant scary squirrels. And uh, back behind him is the ocelot, which I don't know, I've always thought ocelot was one of the strangest names of any sort of uh, member of the cat family. Yeah, so many different uh, types of interesting animals in this section. The three-toed sloth, always love the sloth and kind of their approach to life. <laughs> How they, uh, you know, they just hang out in a tree, they sleep almost constantly and uh, just kind of take life as it comes. This is the giant anteater. It says that their tongue, their tongue is two feet long, which is, uh, that's, 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 that's ludicrous. That is quite the tongue. Back there, the, the cabibara, which is the largest rodent in existence. You sometimes see them at fairs or carnivals, and they, they will they'll claim them to be giant rats. Here's a baby Brazilian taper. It's, uh, it says that it is a relative of the rhinoceros. I guess a smaller relative of the rhinoceros. Again, I think this is a, a small baby taper. They says they do get about 350 to 600 pounds. Here is the bison diorama. And this uh, kind of explains how this, this is a, a very sentimental and nostalgic display for many of the the locals. It's been uh, on display since uh, the uh, 1890s. So uh, a long time, people coming, generations coming and seeing the buffalo here. And I can relate. I remember, you know, my local museum was the Milwaukee Public Museum. And I remember, you know, you come back and the animals are always in the same spot, always doing the same thing. It's always kind of a comforting uh, feeling coming back and seeing the animals. I remember one of the main displays at the Milwaukee Public Museum was a scene of Native Americans and, uh, and bison. It's kind of one of the classic uh, dioramas there. It's always interesting, like the, 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 the local dioramas, what's, uh, what's special to people. In fact, leave a comment in the comment section if you have like a special museum scene or diorama that's uh, particularly special to you or memorable uh, that you have visited over the years. These are all different species of birds of paradise. And some of these are just um, almost ridiculous looking. They almost don't even seem real. The like crazy, crazy bird designs. Over here at the African savanna section. Got the big lion there, the hyena. The warthog, all these are animals that appeared in the uh, in the Lion King. We have an aardvark, which is always a fun name. And then this is a serval. I know some people have, uh, some people keep servals as pets, almost as a, like a larger, scarier version of the uh, house cat. You can see the cheetah there, the fastest land animal with its icy stare. Now this is a hyrax. I don't know that much about hyraxes, but apparently this is one of the closest living relatives to the elephant, which is crazy. You know, when you look at it, you don't necessarily see a lot of elephantness in them. They're very small, like, like, like so much smaller than an elephant. They don't have a, a trunk or tusks, but it says that there's a lot of similarities in their teeth, toes, and skull. And uh, so they are one of the closest relatives of the elephant. And uh, another close relative of, the, of this family tree is manatees. So this little guy is related to manatees and elephants. But he kind of just looks like a little groundhog. Up there we got a coyote on the shelf and uh, a little prairie dog right there. 
It's another little cute little prairie dog scratching himself. Sitting here next to the bison skull, we have a bison bladder. Can you imagine how much bison urine you could fit in there. This drawers here. Guess we can pull them out. Oh yeah. Some butterflies and insects in there. What's in this one? Oh my gosh, it's a drawer. A drawer of snakes. Oh, there's just one snake there. And uh, a couple of toads. Looking up at this wall of heads here. There's the two lion heads there in the middle. We've got the wildebeest up there. Wildebeest, another, another creature from the Lion King. And then down here, I don't know, this guy here, the car caracal. He's like a cat with some really awesome ears. Some sea creatures over here. We got the sea lion. A couple of, couple of narwhal tusks back there. And hanging up above is a blue whale. Of course, not a, not a life-size blue whale. That would be absurd. There wouldn't be room in this building for a life-size blue whale, but that's a little mini, a little mini whale. A tiny little baby zebra there. Also a very tiny baby giraffe there as well. Some heads on the wall there. We got a uh, walrus head on the wall. We got some uh, reindeer heads over on this side. Some cute little bunnies down here. Some cute adorable foxes and some terrifying vicious grizzly bears right there. Of course, grizzly bears, very terrifying type of bear, but I've noticed something about bears. It seems the colder it gets, the more terrifying the bears become. As you know, grizzly bears, as terrifying as they are, they don't hold a candle to Mr. Polar Bear right here. Look at him, oh my gosh. And uh, if that's not enough, this is an Alaskan brown bear there. He is immensely tall and immensely terrifying. And across the way here is an exhibit called We Think Extinct. An exhibit about extinct and endangered animals. Start over here in the Paleozoic era. We have this massive, uh, massive giant fish head here. Imagine if, uh, imagine if fish still looked like that. Coming over here to the Mesozoic area, we see uh, the Ariops. Ariops there, he's like a giant froggy salamander-like creature. And it talks about uh, the mass extinction events. This is actually the third mass extinction event here. Causes were continental drift and uh, volcanic activity. Coming over here to the dinosaurs, which are of course extinct. But man, yeah, I wish we still had a few Triceratops still around. Now we're in the Cenozoic era with some uh, chunks of extinct animals here. There's the poor, poor little dodo. The dodo, a bird who lived on an island where there was no predators, nothing dangerous. So he grew large and helpless. Didn't, didn't bother anyone and no one bothered him until people showed up. Of course, people were not kind to the dodo as well as the animals that uh, people introduced with them. And the dodo who had developed no natural defenses at all over, uh, over thousands of years but was, was completely decimated and left extinct by mankind. Here's a lowland gorilla, which fortunately is not extinct. Unfortunately, it is uh, critically endangered. And according to this, we are currently in the stages of the sixth mass extinction. It says that a lot of this is possibly caused, unfortunately caused by us as humans having a negative impact on the world around us. It's the current Bermuda coral reef there. You see the big old lobster. Those are, those are parrot fish there, the blue ones. This is a swan mussel. Kind of the uh, diagram there of the 
the intestinal system of the muscle, which is way more complex than you would uh, than you would think from from eating them. And here is an extinct bird, the great auk, and uh, another bird that actually was extinct, the California condor, which actually there was no California condors left in the wild at all. In 1987, they were declared extinct. However, there were a few of them in captivity, and they were actually able to successfully breed them and re-release them into the wild. So a very rare case of an animal becoming un- extinct. This case has items that are all made from animals. You have a tiger bone tincture, some uh, medication made from tiger bones. There's a big pile of ivory, of course that's made from elephants' tusks there. The fur coat, and then the purse that's made out of a uh, alligator. These are pangolins, which they describe as small, weird, and disappearing. It says uh, pangolins are the animals that are most frequently illegally trafficked. It says their meat is considered a delicacy in China, and uh, also people like to take their scales and make jewelry out of them, so that's not good. Hopefully the, hopefully the pangolin can hang in there. It says the red panda up there is a vulnerable species. This particular one looks like he's vulnerable to shark attacks. I've seen a lot of different animals, but now it is time to check out some human items. These are artifacts, different objects made uh, by humans. A lot of different items made by people, different baskets here, some interesting hats. But look what they have here. Yes, they have a Fiji mermaid here at the Buffalo Science Museum. Now for those of you that may not be familiar, a Fiji mermaid is a uh, item that was displayed as a genuine real mermaid in sideshows and museums. But in fact, it was a, it was a hoax, a lot of the Original Fiji mermaids were monkeys and fish taxidermied together. This one here, not a monkey. It's actually a wooden form with a fish body attached to the back. And then also the fish mouth is mounted in, uh, in the mouth of the, uh, of the mermaid here. And uh, yeah, the famously P.T. Barnum displayed a, uh, a, Fiji, a Fiji mermaid claiming it was real. And of course, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I lo I'm fascinated with the uh, the Fiji mermaids. I actually have a very small collection uh, of my own of uh, of modern Fiji uh, Fiji mermaids. This one here is actually on display at the 1901 Pan American Exposition. So a World Fair type event in uh, Buffalo, New York. This was displayed apparently in the African Village section of the uh, exposition. So, very fascinating piece of history. I love seeing this. A lot of museums have Fiji mermaids, but uh, choose not to display them. The Milwaukee Public Museum does not display theirs. Apparently there's a uh, Harvard owns a mermaid they don't display as well. So, big kudos to the Buffalo Science Museum for the displaying of the Fiji mermaid. This looks like positively the most uncomfortable outfit I've ever seen. Looks like it would be like just wearing a giant wicker basket on your body. In this uh, case, we have different items showing how different cultures uh, deal with death and mourning. A lot of cultures have a much more positive view of death than, uh, than our American culture. I see this piece from Mexico here, this skeleton with uh, a man's face in his belly. Of course, the Egyptians, well known for their fixation with death. This is the sarcophagus of Jed Hor F. Ankh, who apparently was a choir master back in ancient Egypt. So a, an excellent singer there. Now his body is not in the sarcophagus here. 
it does say it just says on the sign that the body was not preserved and uh, I used to be really curious about why there were so many empty sarcophaguses in uh, in museums because you know of course they're they're caskets they, they their their entire purpose is to hold uh, deceased bodies but I have found out that uh, people over the over the hundreds of years have done horrible things to the actual mummies from grinding them up into medicine to just using them as firewood which is uh, pretty horrific this is a book on anthropology written in 1650 so probably probably some questionable things put in here you can see it's open to this chapter man transformed and talks about the artificial changeling it's talking about uh, i guess cultures that used piercings and place items in their lips or face the artificial changeling that's definitely definitely a interesting way of uh of uh, talking about people with with piercings oh people should start using that term uh, in modern times now the full name of this book is anthropometamorphosis man transformed or the artificial changeling historically presented in the mad and cruel gallantry foolish bravery ridiculous beauty filthy fineness and loathsome loveliness of most nations fashioning and altering their bodies from the mold intended by nature with a vindication of the regular beauty and honesty of nature and an appendix of the pedigree of English gallant. Oh my gosh. I love this mask right here with the the bearded face with the deer growing out of his forehead. And here we head into Explore You, the uh, human health section of the museum. You can see the greeted by the beating heart there. And this here is Wobbling Willie. He is a skeleton from 1934. If you're wondering why they call him Wobbling Willie, so we press and hold this button here, and oh, look at that! <laughs> look at Wobbling Willie, this super spooky skeleton as he moves his hands there. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> oh, I love, I love Wobbling Willie. This is like a, uh, almost like a Halloween, <laughs> Halloween display as he moves his hands. Oh, super spooky there, Willie. Oh, as he moves his ghoulish, creepy, spooky hands. And Wobbling Willie here was actually at the Center of Progress Exposition in Chicago in 1933. So, a uh, World Fair skeleton here. A World Fair wobbling, super spooky skeleton. There's some more skulls over here. We have uh, an orangutan skull, a chimpanzee skull, a early human skull, and a modern human skull. And these uh, vials in the back show the brain capacity, or like the, the, the volume they have in their head ready to be filled by brains. It's the orangutan, chimpanzee, early human, all about equal. But man, look how much, look how much junk we could put in our head. See this human body here. It says, How are you like a factory? We look up in the brain here, see the different sections. Our judgment is a courtroom, our intelligence is a classroom. There's a vision there, they have a giant camera. Here's, I guess here's where they control the, the heartbeat. Oh, this guy up here is controlling the glands. And then the nerve center looks like it's like an old uh, telephone operator. Well, let's get this factory fired up here. Watch how the uh, okay. Watch how the how the body works here. And see, oh, that's that's the wind going in the lung. There's the heart pumping right there. Oh, here's the liver. You can see they're breaking down sugar and starch. In uh, in that machine there, the stomach 
the stomach right there. And uh, oh, down here we can see see the uh, the turds being washed out of the body. Yeah. So I guess uh, anyone wondering how the body worked, uh, this is this is pretty much pretty much how right here. This body slices here. When I first saw this, I thought this was going to be an, a, an actual dissected human because uh, one of the museums I grew up going to. The uh, Museum of Science and Industry actually has slices of actual human body on display, but this here is actually a a wooden uh, a wooden recreation of what a sliced up human body would look like. So yeah, you can look there into uh, into his brains there, and the fact that he's wood just makes me more uh, more comfortable knowing that it's not just a deli sliced person. <laughs> now let's see what my resting heart rate is. Because I put my hands here on these bars, and that will tell me what my uh, heartbeat is. All right, there's my resting heartbeat. It's changing rapidly. Is that one 114? Is that good? I don't know. What's it? Is it going up? 116. Okay. Slowly climbing though. I don't know. I don't know if this makes me healthy or not. 120. Why is it going up? Why is it going up so fast? This exhibit is called In Motion. Everything is on the move, including fish. It's the life of a crash test dummy. It says this is Mr. Cal Span. He is a, 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 a crash test dummy that worked for 30 years. I guess he's now uh, now retired. Retired must be, being a retired crash dummy sitting in a museum must be uh, much easier than being forced to be in horrific car accidents all day. I guess this is one of the uh, car accidents Mr. Cal Span was involved in. Yikes. It's always scary the, 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 the air, when the airbag comes out. I've had that happen one time to me. That was really, really, uh, really terrifying. And uh, yeah, you see the front of this car smashed up quite a bit. This is a sculpture called Range of Motion and of a Rube Goldberg Esque machine. You can see all the turning and moving parts there. You can see the bird up there flapping its wings. Looks like that bird is made out of a sock. You can see the doves up there moving. And then uh, whatever, whatever this thing is down here, it's some sort of giant mechanical fish of some sort. All right, it says for us to walk along this walkway here and it will analyze our walk. Okay, and there I am. Apparently I walk 1.7 miles per hour. My stride length is two feet and my energy score is two. Now this section here is called Bug Works, talking about different insects and you can see the sign here actually comprised of actual butterflies. You look closer. I guess there's other insects mixed in there as well. But uh, yeah, all the words made out of insects. A lot of, a lot of butterflies in there. So we go into this dark bug tunnel here. Oh, lights up there. You can see those are butterflies there. And those are moths. You can see the difference there. Moths have different coloration, not quite as bright usually as butterflies. And then, oh, not the bees. They're behind us. Different types of bees and other stinging insects. Oh, all the different flies there, ready to ruin your picnic. Now this whole display here is dedicated to the art form of cricket fighting. You can see the actual crickets there, pinned to the board. And then we have some different containers for holding crickets. A little wooden cricket cage there. There's some smaller cricket cages down there as well as little food dishes and water dishes. And uh, then this right here is the battle arena where they'll put two crickets in and only one cricket leaves. And these larger than life insect diagrams are show just how horrifying insects really look see the house fly there that's gonna land on your uh 
on your hot dog, on the end of your hot dog, and then you have to eat it afterwards. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's a ant. I guess that's a bisected ant. You can see all the ant intestines inside. And then a uh, horrifying model of a flea. Right now your dog has about 8,000 of these on them right now. <laughs> Behind me you can see this yellow jacket nest that is bigger than my head. That is almost as big as my torso. Yikes. Yeah, look at this bee's nest here. It's cut open so you can see the different layers inside. You know, all these uh, individual bees pinned on the back here. And uh, yeah, the different cross sections of the bee house. See the different bug houses here. You can see down here the, the bees inside the stump there that's oh wow that's pretty amazing next we enter our marvelous earth with this giant globe here in uh in the center now this is pretty cool you can pick different maps to overlay on this earth let's do uh the earth in uh 15 1581 you can see uh, the primitive map there. We can rotate it as well. I think that's, oh yeah, there's America right there. See the old map there. I think they might have a few, uh, few chunks, a few important chunks missing. Okay, there's air traffic over one day. We can see all the, all the planes flying around the earth there like like little bugs where you can switch it to being a political boundary map there here is uh world languages how they're dispersed oh yeah look how many languages they speak in africa oh this map here this is human suffering uh so oh wow a lot of extreme human suffering in uh, in Africa. Let's see how much human suffering we have over in the United States. Oh, not a lot. Not a lot of uh, of human suffering in the United States. Um, a lot in uh, right below us in uh, Mexico and uh, South America. Let's see uh, global shipping routes. Right. Uh, right there and uh let's, now let's turn it into the death star where's the oh yeah there's the big uh big uh big laser cannon right there here's a relief map of the local area we have lake erie right there with uh with buffalo that's the city we're currently in of course buffalo close to not only lake erie but uh Lake Ontario up there, so pretty close to two different, two different Great Lakes, and then of course Buffalo right here next to uh, the Canadian border. And our final exhibit here is Buffalo in space, and there you can actually see an actual buffalo flying through space. Actually, he's wearing <laughs> wearing an astronaut helmet there. You can see the little Earth couch there in the middle of the exhibit where you can uh, take a little rest. But the Earth couch here has its own little moon rotating, uh, rotating around the couch. Here you can uh, vote for your favorite space captain. I guess putting these balls in these tubes to vote for your favorite uh, space captain. There's Leela. I don't know who Captain Leela is. If you know who Captain Leela is, leave a comment in the comment section. There's Star-Lord, he's from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Picard from Star Trek. And wow, no one likes Picard. <laughs> the uh, Star-Lord is in second place, and then Leela. So maybe, yeah, yeah, I need to figure out who Captain Leela is because uh, they, got, uh, they got the most little balls. I would vote, but uh, we've run out of voting balls for the day. Here we can see how big the planets are. You can see the Buffalo skyline there. As we guess we can insert different planets into the background. Let's see what Earth would look like 
over the Buffalo skyline. Okay, a little earth there. Let's go with a, let's go with a big planet here. Let's give them Jupiter. Jupiter, oh my gosh. Jupiter is way bigger than, than Buffalo. Let's see how, uh, see how Saturn looks. Oh yeah, that's big too. That's big too. I think it's time to, time to bring it down just a little bit. And let's see what Buffalo looks like next to your anus. Okay, that's a nice, that's a nice middle ground. We have some different meteorites here. This big one is called Canon Diablo. It's 210 pounds. And then we have some tiny little baby meteorites there around the outside. Oh boy, here we go. We have a giant science ball here. We gotta put our hands on it. Ah, ah, God, the electricity is pulsing through my body. Oh my God, God, oh my gosh. Oh, the power, the power of the sci science ball. I feel it transforming me. God. And here we have a rocket lab where we can construct our own rockets and test them. Here are our rocket materials here. We got a sheet of paper. Okay, so I guess we gotta take a sheet of paper and wrap it around this tube to make our rocket. Wrap it around. We got the, uh, this is this mask, masking tape here. Can't have an open, can't have an open hole on the top of our rocket. So we'll twist it off there, and uh, let's take our rocket here for a flight. So there is our target here. Here is our rocket launcher. We we'll place the rocket on the end of the launcher there. Get it lined up. Try to get it through that circle there, and then we hit. The launch button. Oh, it went pretty far, but it did not go through the hole. It actually, had some some good uh, good velocity behind it. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty narrow hole. Trying to get it through there, you can see how all these rockets have failed. So, thank you for joining me here today at the Buffalo Science. Museum had a great time once again. Uh, there's some, some cool quirky stuff here. You yeah, got the uh, the Fiji mermaid. They have uh, the the wobbling willy, the skeleton. Some uh, some very fun stuff here. Some great taxidermy as well. I was a little disappointed that some of the some of the exhibits were closed uh, or changed over from the last time I was here. I think that's maybe just just just, uh, just a reminder that you know you need to check back at your local museums often to see the new exhibits, see what they have coming through. I definitely need to sit down and look at you know some of my favorite museums and see what uh, exhibits are coming up in them. And again, I, I love different museums. I would love suggestions on different museums you guys would like to see me check out. Please leave a comment in the comment section letting me know what museums to check out. But uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. I, I, I definitely appreciate you watching me and following me along on uh, these adventures. Uh, for those of you new here, I travel around the country. I film roadside attractions, amusement parks, museums, haunted houses, other fun random stuff. If you'd like to support the channel, consider donating to Patreon. $3 or more will get you a postcard once a month from me to you. Also selling enamel pins in the Etsy shop, and I'm currently doing cameos, personalized greetings, personalized messages. Uh, you can send them to friends, family. You can even, if you have some questions you wanna ask me, you can send one to yourself. I've had a lot of fun doing them, and uh, it's been really, really a fun experience. So uh, all that, of course, all that helps keep this train on the track, this boat in the water, and this dirigible in the air. Until next time, my friends, this one's in the bag.